that he's a lawyer in London, but he's also a history buff, and uh, he's done a lot of research on our program, what our program is about tonight. And uh, so I'm just going to let John do the talking. <coughs> and uh, he's got a presentation here. Richard is going to be videotaping it, so we will have a copy. And I did check with the lawyer before <laughs> that I'm Good. not overstepping by having <laughs> it recorded. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Yes. Uh, no, I, you can hear me back. I'll speak up with you. If suddenly I'm talking too quietly, let me know. But I've never been accused of speaking softly. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here this evening. Uh, as Joanna has indicated, I've been a history buff since I was a little kid, probably because of my background. Uh, Joanna calls me Gloria John because she has difficulty pronouncing my last name. <laughs> You can tell by the ski a uh, Polish extraction. And so my parents, of course, went through the wars. My mother went through Siberia and all that stuff. So she told me all the stories, and I became fascinated by history. Uh, I thought before I start my presentation this evening, I would let you know how it came about that I researched the story of the home bank uh, robber here in Melbourne. In the late 1980s, I was served for six years on the London Police Board, and being the history buff that I said I am, I asked if there was a history of the London Police. Apparently, Charles Addington had in fact written one, but it was very brief. It was almost like a booklet, 45 pages, and that was it. So I thought, hey, I can do that. So I said, I'm going to research it. I started when the police force in London was created in 1855 and slowly chugged along. Uh, the editor of the London Police Association's news quarterly, it's called The Observer, said, would you mind doing you know, an article for each edition you know, of, our, of our history? So I did, and a couple of times I threw in uh, stories about hangings that occurred in London. Believe it or not, London Police, like everybody else, would prefer you know, all the gory details of murders rather than their own history. And they said, why don't you focus on all the people who were hanged in London? So I did. It took, there was 19 of them, as you probably know, or maybe you don't know. Uh, 18 of them were, were men, and one was a woman, Phoebe Camp. She had the distinction of being the first and only woman to hang in Middlesex County. She also had the distinction of being the first woman to hang in all of Canada. So we've got that little bit of uh, local history. Did you do it rather? Yeah. Uh, allegedly, she and her boyfriend, the hired man, oh. took an axe and, and killed him one night. Anyway, um, as we all know, when uh, an event recedes into the past, memories grow dim, and in time, details are forgotten. So the event becomes less recognizable because whoever retells the story tends to embellish it in order to make it more exciting or to play out his or her role. Uh, probably an excellent example of this human tendency is to, uh, to dramatize is Orville Miller. Some of you may have read some of his books. The most common one that people have read is that Donnelly's Must Die. Uh, that is one that is not entirely fact factually correct. Uh, he is uh, the one to whom they attributed the statement, never let a fax get in the way of a good story. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, Melbourne, <laughs> excuse me, the Melbourne home bank robbery is four years short of its centennial. It's been told and retold many times in books, pamphlets, magazine articles. And although the basic facts don't change, some of the details do. Uh, transcripts trial transcripts no longer exist. I guess they were thrown out, whatever. But I relied on the daily newspaper reports simply because you know, they were done contemporaneously with the event. So they're generally accurate, even though they're written in what I call the exaggerated style of the day. Back then, as now, you know, they had to get these eye-grabbing headlines in order to sell copies. Uh, perhaps the most reliable source, and I noticed that Joanne passed it there on the table, 
was Justice Lennox's report dated February 17, 1924, which the Canadian government requested that he write when Sidney asked to have his death sentence commuted. I would like to think that, uh, excuse me there, I'll keep jumping to the second one. I would like to think that the judge's outline of the evidence is most reliable, and so I've accepted his account where it differs from other sources. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I would like to think he was accurate. So, Sidney's story. First, I'd like to correct a common misconception some people have. People think that Sidney and his brother William were both hanged. That is not the case. The only one of the four involved in the robbery, Sidney, was hanged. No one else, so get that out of the way. Well, as you can see here, the bank robbery took place on April 11th. I expect that day dawned like every other day in Melbourne. Nobody expected any excitement. It was a sleepy little town, like most towns or villages. But on that day, four men who, for whatever reason, I guess being lazy, preferred to steal money rather than make an honest living, decided to rob the bank. These four men who were later identified as the brothers Sidney and William Morrell, Ernest Pat Norton, and Henry Slim Williams. Because William's last name sounds very much like William Morrell, I've taken to calling them by their first names so that there's no confusion. Early in the morning of April the 11th, the men had stolen a gray North motor vehicle from a garage in Byron. Their original intention was to drive to Windsor and get some money through some form of a criminal activity. They set out rather early in the morning, arriving here in Melbourne at about 6 o'clock or shortly thereafter in the morning. They stopped and purchased a couple of uh, packs of players' cigarettes from uh, uh, the storekeeper, John Little. Then they drove out of town and further west a couple of miles and for whatever reason pulled off into a farmer's field, sat down, made a bonfire, and started drinking whiskey. They must have had quite a supply of whiskey because they were still there five hours later. Uh, at that point in time, Norton, one of the four, got the bright idea and said, why, or language, why the hell should we drive all the way to Windsor? Why don't we just go back to that little village we passed and rob one of the banks? Uh, perhaps it was that you know, little bit of liquid encouragement that uh, made them decide that. Why it was that they chose the home bank and not the Union Bank, which is directly across the street, we don't know. Uh, maybe it was just a random choice. They decided that Slim would be the guard at the front door, while the others would enter the bank with guns drawn and yelling at everybody to put up their hands. They focused on subduing Roy McCandless, who was the uh, teller. Agnes Campbell, excuse me, I missed something here. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Agnes, Agnes Campbell, when they entered the, uh, the bank, quietly closed the safe door while they were focused on the manager and slipped up the front door past Slim, who was supposed to be guarding her, <laughs> and did nothing to stop her. Uh, Agnes immediately went ahead and raised the alarm, and a number of citizens responded, among them three of the Campbell brothers, Stuart, Robert, and Russell. Robert and Stuart went through the front door, Russell went to the side, up the alley, in case someone was going to try to escape that way. When Slim alerted the others inside the bank that armed men were approaching the bank, the three men inside the bank decided to cut and run. As they fled outside the, or out the side door, they ran into Russell, who, although he was unarmed, was bravely trying to restrained Sidney, whom he saw carrying a bag which obviously contained the money he had taken. During the struggle, Sidney's revolver went off twice and Campbell fell to the ground. The townspeople chased Sidney down the main street, caught him, and tied him to a nearby telephone pole. Within the hour, Will Wilfred Danford, an Oneida Indian from the nearby Muncie Reserve, found William Morrell hiding in the hayloft of a 
car that stood at the rear of the bank. The angry residents of Melbourne tied him to a telephone pole as well. A loaded revolver was found in the hay where he had, in fact, been hiding. When Slim fled out the side door and came out of the alley, he was seen by Everton Theaker, who was the manager of the Union Bank across the street. Theaker, having heard that a robbery was in progress, had grabbed a revolver. I guess in those days, bank managers had revolvers, perhaps for obvious reasons, and fired several shots at Slim as he ran down the street. One of the shots, probably luckily, struck him in the hand that he was holding the revolver, and he dropped it. Slim recognized when there was no hope of escaping, so he raised his hands and surrendered, and several of the townspeople tied him to yet another telephone pole. A call came to the London Police Department about the robbery, and so the London Police Force dispatched these two gentlemen, Inspector of Detectives Thomas Nichol and then Detective Harry Down. Harry Down later was a London Police Chief from 1920 to 1930. They jumped in a brand new Page touring car. These are names of car makers that no longer exist. Gray Dort, Page, you have to go on the internet to see them. They arrived at the scene just in time to save the robbers from being lynched. They calmed down the crowd, untied the robbers, handcuffed them, and placed them in the rear of their motor vehicle. They realized that the fourth robber, Pat Norton, had managed to escape. So London detectives and constables from London and the county immediately set out into the surrounding area, hoping to find him. They didn't catch him, but they did find a car that he had stolen, but had abandoned after it broke down. This, as you can see, is the grave door that they stole from Byron. Sidney, his brother William, and Slim were no strangers to the justice system. The day after they were arrested for this attempted robbery, they appeared in the London police court and pleaded guilty to earlier charges of having violently robbed the Lee brothers in London. They were two Chinese laundrymen, and they were also, by the way, charged with stealing a car. Not this one, but another one. Sidney was born in England in 1899. He came to Canada with his parents in 1906. He enlisted in the Canadian Army when he was only 15 years old and was sent overseas to England to fight in the First World War. He returned to Canada after he was wounded. His brother William, on the other hand, had joined the 33rd Battalion in London when he was 18, but William did not serve overseas. The murder victim, Russell Campbell, had served overseas with the 49th Battalion in France. He was buried with full military honors at the Melbourne Cemetery on April 14, 1921. The newspapers described that the funeral procession that day consisted of nearly 200 automobiles and was led by a party of 16 soldiers from the Royal Canadian Regiment. As his casket was lowered into the ground, three shots were fired, and the last post was sounded. In respect for the dead man, all businesses in the village were closed that day so that everyone could attend the funeral. When I, excuse me, I think I went the wrong way. When I went to the Melbourne Cemetery to take a photograph of the Campbell Monument, I initially missed the location of Russell Campbell's grave because his name didn't appear on the face. I eventually noticed that his name was inscribed on the side of the monument, something which is not very often done. So in case you're curious and have nothing to do on the weekend, want to slip up there, look at the side of the monument. The day following, uh, the day following Russell's interment, 
an inquest was held here in the village into his death. That was, of course, a legal requirement at the time. The three prisoners showed up. They were represented by lawyer James Donoghue of London. And, of course, they were driven from London to Melbourne for the inquest by detectives Nicol and Down. Irma Wright was the first person who testified at the coroner's inquest. Did she was a ledger. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, the accounts of the day have got her first name wrong. It's Irma. E-R-N-A. E-R-N-A? Yes. Thank you very much. I'll make a note of this. She's my aunt. E-R-N-A. E-R-N-A. Yes. Okay. If you spot any errors here as I go along, please let me know so that if and when I finally publish my book, I'll have the correct spellings. Yes, right. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. So we'll make the correction. Um, she was the ledger keeper at the home bank. She indicated that just as the men were entering the bank, she was going out for whatever reason. Something about the men's behavior made her suspicious, and she logically reached the conclusion they might be intending to rob the bank. So she immediately alerted the townsfolk. Agnes Campbell, who had worked as a teller in the bank for five years, stated that when she saw the uh, robbers with the bank manager, she realized the robbery was in progress, closed the safe door, and calmly walked out the front door, as you've already heard, past Williams, who, uh, past Slim Williams, who pointed the gun at her, but didn't shoot. Stuart Campbell then testified that when he saw Sidney struggling with his brother in the alley, he rushed for, forward to help, but before he could reach them, he rallied fire, and his brother was killed. The next witness at the coroner's inquest was Dr. Roderick Dewar of Melbourne. He was the one who had performed the post-mortem on uh, Russell Campbell's body, and he was assisted by Dr. Friel of Glencoe. He told the uh, inquiry that uh, the first bullet fired by Sidney had merely grazed Russell's side, but the second one hit his left side below the heart, several numerous blood vessels, and almost caused instantaneous death from hemorrhage. The inquest concluded with Detective Harry Downs' testimony that Sidney had identified a Colt 45 as being his gun, while his brother and Slim each picked, up, picked out one of the 38s. The jury had no difficulty, by jury I mean corner jury, had no difficulty in concluding that Russell had been killed by a bullet fired by Sidney. Since the killing of Russell had occurred during an attempted robbery, in the eyes of the law, they were all equally guilty of his murder. Therefore, all three were charged with murder. According to newspaper reports of the day, the three men seemed to view the entire incident as a joke. According to Dr. James Wilson, who was the physician at the Middlesex Jail, they laughed and joked about and even staged a mock trial at which one of them was a crown attorney, one of them played the judge, and the third one was the murderer who they found guilty and pretended to hang him with a necktie. Dr. Wilson was disgusted with their behavior and described them as vicious innocents. Probably not too far off. A local priest who had in fact spoken with them reported that when he asked them, he says, do you believe in hell? He says, they responded that, sure, it's down in Kingston, and we'd rather not, we'd rather be hanged than go down there. As we all know, of course, Sidney eventually got his wish. Uh, on April 21st, 1921, the police car in which the detectives were driving the three men to Melbourne, this time for a preliminary hearing, for whatever reason, overturned in a ditch just, just east of here. No one was injured, and the men, although they were handcuffed together, made no attempt to escape. Uh, probably embarrassed, embarrassed that this had happened, the detectives did not offer any explanation for why they rolled the car into the ditch. That was also not the only unusual occurrence that day,
because the building in which the preliminary hearing was to be held was filled with so many spectators that a part of the floor collapsed and the people fell into the basement. The same witnesses who testified at the coroner's inquest, of course, testified at the preliminary hearing. Squire Chittick, who was presiding over the preliminary hearing, committed all three of the men uh, to trial on the charges of murder, and they went back to the jail in London. Deputy Sheriff Waterworth was concerned that the men, being faced with a serious charge of murder, would make an attempt to escape. So he asked Middlesex Council to authorize two additional guards. This didn't prevent them from trying to escape because on May 2nd of 1921, they made an, escape, an attempt to escape, but it was foiled when, they, when it was discovered that they had punched a hole through the ceiling of their cell. Four months later, however, another escape attempt by the Murrell brothers succeeded. At about 8 p.m. the evening of September 2nd, 1921, turnkey William McLeod discovered that the Murrells had escaped. The men had sawed through the iron bars of their cell window. It was believed that the saw had been smuggled into the cell in a basket of food that their mother had brought them the previous day. After they squeezed through the opening they made in the window, they would have dropped into the jail yard. A few weeks earlier, construction work had commenced on building a new wall, and the construction workers negligently had left two ladders in the yard, which the murals used to scale the wall. It was then a matter of simply dropping onto the roof of a tool shed on the, on the other side of the wall, and then to the ground. Slim didn't escape, however, because several weeks earlier, he had complained to authorities that the murals were mistreating him, so he was placed in a separate cell. He didn't escape. As usual, notices of the escape were wired and telephoned to police stations throughout Ontario. A search, however, was not organized because at that time, county constables were only paid for actual arrests and not for time they spent investigating or searching. In order to get some activity or get people to start looking for the men, Middlesex County offered the initially offered a two thousand dollar reward, which is then eventually up to three, for their recapture. On January 12, 1922, Magistrate Graydon of London's police course court sentenced Slim to seven years for his involvement in the robbery of the two Chinese laundry firms. He was sent to Kingston to start serving his sentence. Sixteen months later, on May 28, 1923, readers of the advertiser newspaper learned that Sydney had been arrested and was being held in a jail in San Francisco, California. He had been identified by the distinctive tattoos on his body. Good reason not to ink your body. It was revealed that after escaping from Middlesex County, the Burrell brothers had traveled throughout the United States. Sydney, unknowingly, had purchased a car which was stolen. This, of course, led to his arrest. He probably didn't appreciate the irony of being captured as a result of another man's crime. <coughs> Sydney was so embarrassed that they had only managed to steal $1,500 from the home bank and had been apprehended by ordinary townsfolk that he lied to the San Francisco police and bragged that he and the others were escaping with $38,000 when the coppers closed in. Nothing like making it dramatic. Sydney was eventually extradited to Canada to face the murder charge. Two OPP officers traveled to San Francisco, returned with him to Canada, arriving in St. Thomas on July 27, 1923, on a Michigan Central Railway train. Sydney was then immediately driven to London and placed in the same cell from which he had originally escaped. But this time, the sheriff was not going to take any chances. He stationed an armed guard, an armed guard in front of his cell 
24 hours a day. Sidney's lawyer, James Donoghue of London, challenged the legality of his extradition on the grounds that he had not been afforded an opportunity to cross-examine the witnesses whose affidavit evidence was used in extraditing. Donoghue's challenge was denied and Morales, or Sidney's trial for murder, was ordered to proceed. In an, can I go back for a moment? Yes, I did, sorry. In an unusual move, Justice William Henry Wright, a new appointment to the bench was assigned to the case. I say it's an unusual move because new appointments to the bench are rarely assigned to murder cases. We have no idea as to why he was appointed. Maybe there was a scarcity of judges at that time. Although for quite some time, prisoners had been brought into the main courtroom through the corridors of the Middlesex County Courthouse, in Sidney's case, it was decided that for the purpose of security, they would bring him up through this steep passageway leading directly from the jail to the prisoner's box, which hadn't been used for two or three decades. For any of you who have been in the old uh, main courtroom of the courthouse, you know that this staircase, of course, was closed when the, uh, the old main courtroom was converted into what is now the Middlesex County Council Chambers. This time, to ensure that Morell would not escape again, county officials decided to construct a cell within a cell so that even if Sidney managed to break out the first door, he would still have to get out from the second door. <coughs> It was rather spacious as uh, jail cells go. If you've been in the old uh, London courthouse, you'll see that some of those cells are really small. They look like 10 feet long and maybe 6 feet wide. This one, however, was 20 feet long and 15 feet wide. It's that size of a nice uh, living room. It had a steel ceiling, however, so no more chimney holes in the ceiling. Bars were now steel instead of the weaker iron that had, in fact, uh, been the traditional material for uh, jail cells up to that point. The door was double locked. Two steel benches and a small steel table were embedded in concrete. And the meals were passed through a small opening, which was also double locked. So they really made a lot of effort to make sure Sydney didn't escape this time. Shortly before 2.45, Sydney, in 1923, Sydney and Slim, who had been brought back from King's Penitentiary, were led up that stairway and into the prisoner's box, uh, which you can see there written in the foreground of the picture. And the two of them were surrounded by seven armed guards. Sydney was described as looking rather fit despite his incarceration, but Slim was described as looking like a little old man. He was clearly worried. His hair had turned gray, and his face with its sunken eyes had deep wrinkles. Both men pleaded not guilty to the charge of murdering Russell Campbell. The jury selection only took 40 minutes. Seven of the 12 jurors selected were area farmers. After summarizing for the jury what he hoped to prove, Crown Attorney Rigney called his first witness. That was H. C. McBride, a London architect who produced plans that he had prepared of the home bank and the main street here in Melbourne. The sketch of the street which appeared in the advertiser was reportedly very similar to the plan that was filed in court. Dr. Roderick Dewar, who was the next to testify at the trial, stated that when he arrived at the scene of the shooting, he found Russell lying on his back in the alley, blood seeping from a wound in the side of his chest. He determined that Russell was dead and covered him with a sheet. And as you've already heard later, he and Dr. Freeland Blanco conducted post mortem. Dr. Dewar informed the court that the death was due to the hemorrhage caused by the bullet that had entered Russell's chest. He had removed the bullet and given it to Dr. Woods, the Middlesex County Coroner. 
Dr. Dewar concluded that uh, because of traces of powder burns that he found on Russell's clothing, the gun had been fired within 12 inches of Russell's body. When court resumed at 9.30 the following morning, Roy McCandless, who was the manager of the whole bank, testified that he was standing in the teller's cage when the four men came in and said they wanted to speak with him. He led them into his office, where Pat Norton immediately pulled out, him, pulled out his gun, ordered him to put up his hands, and then shoved him face first into a wall. He dragged him to the safe and ordered him to open it. When he refused to do so, Norton struck him several times over the head with the revolver, causing him to fall. Candles estimated that it was no more than a minute or so when he heard, we now know it was Slim, someone yell out, here they come, and the robbers fled up the side door. He heard gunshots in the alley, and when he went to investigate, that's where he saw Russell lying on the ground. John Little, who you've already heard about, he was a bail clerk here at Melbourne. He advised the court that he had first seen the men at about 6.15 that day when they purchased cigarettes from him. He identified Sydney as being one of those men. He says that he then saw them about five hours later when someone had told him that the bank was being robbed. He followed the rest of the townsfolk to the bank and looked into the alley where he saw Stanley and Russell standing quite close together. Seeing Stanley was holding a gun, he quickly ducked back out of sight. Immediately thereafter, he heard two shots, and then Sydney came running out of the alley, being chased by several men. The men caught him, and as you've already heard, tied him to a telephone pole. Little said that in his haste to escape the townsfolk, Sydney had dropped the bag of money and taken from the bank, so he picked it up and he gave it to Roy McCandless. He also told the court that he heard Stuart Campbell accuse Sidney of shooting his brother, and that Sidney didn't deny it. The other Campbell brother, Robert, and other witnesses also confirmed that Sidney admitting that he shot Russell. When it was Sidney's turn to testify, the third day of the trial, the newspaper, the advertiser, noted that he had deep circles under his eyes and didn't appear to be taking his predicament as lightly as he had when they were first arrested. London uh, Detective Thomas Nichol was called to the stand and related how he and Harry Down had been dispatched to Melbourne, arriving just in time to save the men from a possible lynching. He confirmed that Sidney had identified the Colt 45 as the one he had received and the one he had in his possession that day. And he also produced the bullet that Dr. Uh, uh, Friel had in fact removed from Russell's body. George Sponnenberg, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, he was the Melbourne undertaker at that time. He had also chased Sidney down the street and admitted that he had fired two shots in the slim before he threw his revolver down and surrendered. Although his stated motive in shooting at Slim was to apprehend him, some cynics wondered whether he was simply trying to drum up some new business for his family. Who knows? Everton Peter, who was the manager of the Union Bank across the street, again testified how when he was alerted to the robbery in progress, that he got his revolver and ran towards the alley where he saw Sidney uh, struggling with Russell. When Slim, when Slim rushed out of the alley, Pinker chased him and, as we heard, fired the shots, uh, one of which struck Slim in the hand, causing him to surrender. Stuart Campbell revealed that the rifle he had carried into the bank was not loaded because he couldn't find the proper ammunition for it. So that when he entered and said, hands up, Sidney turned around and shot at him, he had no nothing else to do but the duck because he couldn't fire back. He then saw Russell and his brother struggling in the alleyway and heard the shot that Sidney fired. Sorry, back again.
Flynn was the next person to testify in his own defense. He explained to the court that the only reason he was, he didn't back out after the decision to rob the bank was made was because he was afraid of North. North, you remember, was the guy who was beating the bank manager around about the head with a revolver. He too confirmed the basic facts of the story that they drove into Melbourne, purchased cigarettes, built a bonfire outside of town, smoked and so on, and then finally returned to do the robbery. Slim told the court that he had taken up his assigned spot as a lookout at the front door, just as, sorry, what was her name? Er, Erna? Erna, thank you. Just as Erna Wright was leaving, he politely said good morning to her and didn't stop. Slim described how North had struck the bank manager above the head, knocking him down, almost sending him conscious to the ground, and then yelling at him to get back to the door or I'll blow your damn brains out. When he returned to the front door, that's when he looked out and saw the town, townspeople carrying rifles and guns approaching. He yelled, here they come, and they all ran out the side door. One of the men, in fact, fired at Slim when he was still at the front door, broke the front window of the bank. Slim recalled being shot at by Edward Eaker and surrendering to him. The following morning, the Crown Attorney and the Defense Counsel completed their addresses to the jury and Justice Wright then instructed them. He explained to them that when two or more individuals are involved in a crime and someone is killed, they are all deemed to be guilty of the murder, even though they may not have pulled the trigger. The jury retired to consider their verdict. They returned at 9.32 in the evening to inform Justice Wright that they had been unable to reach a verdict. He asked them to go back and see if they could bring in separate verdicts, because as you know, Sidney and Slim were being tried at the same time. At 1.30 a.m., yes, a.m., they were served food and taken to the large grand jury room at 2.30, where they went to sleep on cots that had been provided to them. They were awakened at 7.30 and began to deliberate again, but by 9 a.m., they told the judge they would not be able to reach a unanimous verdict, and so he had to dismiss them. Since they would have to wait until the next assize was kind of called sittings, Sidney was remanded back in custody while Slim went back to Kingston Penitentiary to continue serving his seven-year sentence for robbing the Lee brothers. On October 25, 1923, the Advertiser published this, the first of its two announcements, excuse me, of a thousand-dollar reward for Pat Norton's arrest as the fourth person involved in the robbery. On January 7, 1924, the jail physician diagnosed Sidney with appendicitis and took him to Victoria Hospital where he had his appendix removed. Although he was expected to remain in the hospital for at least ten days to recover, he was quickly returned to his cell because the authorities had heard rumors that some of his friends might attempt to rescue him. The new trial for the men began on February 5, 1924. It took less than an hour to select the jury, and once again, ten of the twelve were area farmers. Justice Howard Lennox granted Donahue's request that this time, rather than being tried together, the men would be tried separately. Sidney was the first to be tried. The same witnesses were called in the first trial and gave essentially the same testimony. The only new information was that the bullet that Dr. Dewar had removed from Russell's body and given to Dr. Wilson Carter was now missing and couldn't be found. When court resumed on February 6, 1924, Donahue called Sidney to the witness box and asked him to tell his story. Sidney told the court that after they had driven through Melbourne and sat around the bonfire drinking whiskey, it was Norton's idea to go back and rob the bank. And since Sidney's brother, William, was dressed like a businessman, they thought he should enter the bank first and engage the bank manager. Of course, they all agreed to 
slip would be to look at it. He then indicated what happened to the bank. You already heard the story. However, this is where it begins to do. He indicates that when he heard Slim shouting, here they come, he ran into the manager's office for whatever the reason, ran into the note, where he saw him lying on the floor with a Colt 45 revolver beside him. He couldn't explain why he picked up the Colt 45, but in any event, he ended up with it. And just then, uh, Rob, Robert Stewart came in, carrying the rifle, yelling hands up. He denied that he shot at him. He says he shot him to the ceiling just to scare him off, and then ran, uh, started running to the side door. He had said he fired a shot through the side door, again, to frighten everybody, not knowing that there was anybody on the other side. He denied that he specifically shot Russell. He said they never struggled. He says he was never close to him. He just basically said he ran out, never encountered Russell, and when they said that, you know, he in fact had, uh, had pulled the trigger, he just called them all liars. I think he called them degraded perjurers. When he was questioned by Justice Lennox, he said, or he admitted to only firing three shots, not the five that other witnesses had claimed. He insisted that uh, Russell was already in the, lying in the alley, so he had nothing to do with his death. Once again, the uh, Crown Attorney, Brinkley, the Defense Counsel, and Lennox gave their respective addresses to the jury, and Justice Lennox explained again, if someone's killed, you're all equally guilty. Sydney, it took, excuse me, it took the jury less than an hour this time to return with a guilty verdict. Sydney was somewhat surprised, perhaps thinking that once again, we'd have a long jury. But apparently he took it stoically, didn't show any emotion. His father, however, was, was in the courtroom, reportedly bursting into tears. Next, it was Slim's turn. It was revealed that he, too, was a veteran of the First World War. He was 25 years old, but had come to Canada from England via Australia, arriving in Canada when he was 14. After fighting in France, he had returned to Canada in 1919 with an honorable military record. Slim's trial began at 9 a.m. on February 6, 1924. And once again, I don't know why these numbers are identical, but once again, the jury was just composed of 10 the farmers and two others. And again, same witnesses, same testimony. Duncan McCrae, 
He said that although Slim was standing at the counter with a revolver in his hand when he walked into the bank after the robbery had started, the two just said, exchange good days, you know, good day, good day, and then Slim allowed him to leave without making any attempt to stop him or shoot him. I don't know. I just said Duncan would be great. If you could identify him for me, that would be great. Once again, the same arguments were made to the jury. The judge again instructed them that if, in fact, someone dies as a result of a crime, they're all guilty. So, in this particular case, it only took the jury three hours this time. It was less than an hour. It was three hours for Slim. But they did, in fact, return with a guilty verdict in his case as well. However, unlike with Sidney, in his case, they recommended mercy. The following day, on February 9, 1924, it took Justice Lennox only 14 minutes to set Sidney and Slim to hang on April 10. Neither of the men showed any emotion, and neither of the men had any last words. Sidney appealed his conviction to the Ontario Court of Appeal, but it was dismissed. A petition to the Minister of Justice seeking clemency for him managed to collect a total of 15,000 signatures. Kind of unbelievable. Two carpenters began constructing the scaffold on April 7, 1924, because the jail yard where the hangings were to take place could be clearly seen from various vantage points outside the jail walls. So they were ordered to enclose the scaffold on three sides so that only the official execution party would see the hanging or witness the hanging, as required by law. On April 9, 1924, the day before Slim's scheduled execution, Sheriff Donald Graham received a telegram advising him that the Governor General of Canada had commuted his sentence to life in prison in Kingston Penitentiary. Sidney, however, would hang. So shortly before 4 a.m. on April 10, 1924, the day of his execution, Sidney ate a breakfast consisting of tea, toast, and one egg. He then changed from his jail clothes into his civilian clothes. Reverend Warner prayed with him until Arthur Ellis, who was Canada's official executioner, arrived at 5.20 a.m., accompanied by Sheriff Donald Graham and the rest of the hanging party. Ellis handed Sidney a glass which contained a substantial amount of whiskey and liquid morphine prepared by the jail physician. It was a custom to give this concoction to men about to be hanged, I suppose to ease the pain, if you will, although I'm not sure that it helped much. Sidney reportedly didn't struggle as his hands were tied behind his back with leather stripes. Sidney never confessed. He always maintained that although he had fired shots during the bank robbery, he did not think that one of them had killed Russell. His final words on the scaffold reportedly were, God bless my old partner Slim. Kind of a surprising remark, considering it was Slim's incompetence as a lookout that led to Sidney's date with the executioner. Ellis then placed a large square of black cloth over Sidney's head, placed a rope of a noose over the cloth, not behind the left ear, and before Reverend Warner could even begin the Lord's Prayer, Ellis pulled the lever and dropped the floor of the platform, plunging Sidney into his death. Sidney, by the way, didn't die alone that morning. Clarence Topping, who had also been convicted of killing his girlfriend and had also been sent to death, plunged into eternity with him. The scaffold, by the way, was not the usual trap door that we associate with hangings. It was a platform that fell away. The reason, probably, that it had been constructed as such was because originally it had been intended for the triple hanging that they anticipated, Sidney, William, and, of course, Clarence Topping. But 
only clearance is simply for executing that data. The confirmation of Sydney's execution, which was signed, as you can see here, by the sheriff of jail and the high constable, was posted on the main entrance of the Middlesex County Courthouse. Also posted that day was the confirmation by James Wilson, the jail surgeon, that he had examined Sydney's body and was satisfied that he was dead. Later that morning, Slim boarded a national, Canadian National Railway train with two guards and left for Kingston Penitentiary to serve his life sentence. Although I expect Slim eventually attained his freedom, there are no records to indicate when this may have occurred, or at least no records that I have found. Sydney's family claimed his body after he was hung and they buried him in the Pawn Mill Cemetery in London. According to the trustees of the cemetery, he is believed to have been interred in Section B, Row C, Lot 12, a plot that had originally been purchased by William Gilmore. There is no monument with Sydney's name at the site. The master index for all persons interred at the cemetery confuses Sydney with his brother William and lists him as Burrell Conlon William and the date of his death as circa 1920. Unlike the record of other interments which listed the section row and lot number, the entry beside the name Burrell simply says no data. Sydney's burial in that cemetery wasn't without controversy. Some individuals who owned plots or had family members buried in that cemetery objected to the fact that an executed murderer had been buried in close proximity to their dearly departed. They consulted a lawyer and were told that according to the law, the cemetery could not prevent his burial there. It's rather interesting to note, or I find it interesting, that a Reverend McCray wrote a letter to the editor of the Advertiser in which he commented on Sydney's burial and pointed out the following, and I quote, As a matter of fact, his body lies close beside the plot where my loved ones were laid to rest. To me, there is nothing incongruous in the fact that my father, who gave his lifetime service in the Christian ministry to redeem the souls of sinful men and to proclaim the brotherhood of Christ, should rest near those who were the objects of his ministry. A rather, rather generous attitude. It wasn't until almost four years later, on January the 9th, 1928, that the Los Angeles police arrested a man in connection with an auto theft. When they checked his fingerprints, they discovered it was William Garrell. As with his brother, it was the description of the tattoos on his body that allowed the London police to identify him as a fugitive from justice in Canada. In this slide, you can see how much William had changed between the time of his initial arrest and his subsequent recapture. William admitted that he was William Morrell, but denied that he had any part to play in the slaying of Russell Campbell. He indicated that when he and his brother Sidney had escaped, they had traveled to Kansas, working at odd jobs until they had quarreled and went their separate ways. William, of course, ending up in California. William claimed that he never saw his brother again and did not know that he had been hanged for the murder of Russell Campbell. The Ontario government paid out a thousand dollar reward to the two Los Angeles policemen who arrested him. The Ontario government then posted another thousand dollar reward for the capture of Pat Norman. The advertiser also published a story that reported that following the robbery, Norton had put on a woman's dress and walked through police lines. I would like to think that the police were not that gullible. The source of that information was not cited, so it may have been just a pure invention. William, just like his brother before him, was extradited to Canada and two OPP officers from Toronto went to Los Angeles and returned with him to London. Although William was described as a model prisoner on the trip from Los Angeles, his behavior rapidly deteriorated once he was released from prison. 
once he was incarcerated in the jail. In fact, he caused so much trouble with the local authorities that they finally got sick of him and transferred him to the Dawn Jail in Toronto in May of 1928. He stayed there until October of that year when he returned to London to face trial. William's trial began at 145 on October 15, 1928. Several heavily armed constables stood around the prisoner's box to ensure that he didn't escape. And principal actors were Crown Attorney Hugh Guthrie, assisted by London Crown Attorney A.M. Judd. Defending William was James Donahue, whose slide for the face you've already seen. He told reporters that he was confident that William would be acquitted. As usual, the jury was quickly impaneled and the trial began. No point in reiterating the evidence you've heard it many times. Essentially, it was all of the same evidence. Uh, everybody basically said the same thing. Detective Harry Down, of course, had to indicate that William had identified one of the 38s used in the rocket as his gun. He, however, did draw the attention of the court to the fact that William's gun, which had been found in the hay where he had hidden, was fully loaded and had not been fired. The surviving Campbell brothers also confirmed that although William had participated in the robbery of the bank, he was the one who shot Russell and he never pointed his gun at anybody. The final witness, of course, was William Danford, who found him hiding in the hay loft in the barn behind the bank. When the crowd's witnesses were finished, William took the stand. He admitted that uh, originally they were going to travel to Windsor, changed their plans, and returned to rob the bank here in, in uh, Melbourne. He said, however, that when the men entered the bank, that is, Mr. Campbell and the townsman entered the bank, he said he immediately left and ran out to the end of the park because he realized the robbery had failed and he was afraid something bad was going to happen. His lawyer, James Donahue, pointed out that William had already left the bank before any shooting began because he realized the holdup had failed. He agreed that they were engaged in the common purpose of robbing the bank, but insisted that William had abandoned that common purpose before the murder took place and therefore he should not be found guilty of murder under the old, under the, the deemed provision that all involved in the robbery, everybody's guilty of murder. He said, yes, they were all involved in the robbery, but William had left the uh, process of the robbery, if you will, and had already left, so he had divorced himself from what was going on, and he felt that should find him not guilty. Both the Crown Attorney, of course, and the judge said, no, the law is very clear. And so, basically, he should be just as guilty as what the Sydney who pulled the uh, trigger. The jury didn't take very long to come back with a guilty verdict, and they recommended mercy. When the Justice Lo Loki was his name, asked them why they attached the mercy recommendation, they felt that uh, they believed William that he had really intended to abandon the robbery when he realized it was not going to be successful. The judge pointed out to them that he couldn't give him a life sentence. He had to imprison him uh, for life or to for uh, hanging. He sentenced him for hanging. Not everybody apparently was pleased with the death sentence. The foreman of the jury, Thomas Stevenson, told newspaper reporters that the only reason the jury had brought in a guilty verdict was because they believed that by recommending mercy, William would not be sentenced to death, but would in fact be sentenced to life in prison. So apparently, according to Stevenson, there was a misunderstanding there. One of the jurors even went so far as to suggest that Russell had been accidentally shot by Thinker, the manager of the Union Bank, who had fired shots into the alley where Sidney and Russell were struggling. This juror obviously either chose to ignore or had conveniently forgotten the evidence that there were powder marks on Russell's clothing. 
was something that clearly could not have happened if the shots were fired from a distance. He, of course, complained that his theory couldn't be proven because neither the clothes nor the bullet could not be found to be gone missing. Since, under Canadian law, jurors are not permitted to discuss their deliberations with the public, it didn't take long for the board of jury selectors to meet and pass a resolution that all those members of the jury who had spoken publicly would be forever barred from serving on any juries in the future. Given the length of some of today's criminal trials, I think that would be a blessing rather than a punishment. Less than three days before his execution, William got the good 